one we are live hello and welcome to product lessons a podcast channel where we talk to product leaders from all over the world and learn from them how they build and manage world class software products so uh, since my conversations on on this podcast are often uh, deep and long you can also listen to them in spotify just go to spotify and search for uh, product lessons i just realized that there is a glitch on my audio let me quickly set that up uh, looks good all right so today i'm thrilled to have with me abhimanyu dasgupta founder of uh, unravel an exciting and, and radically different uh, travel discovery platform i mean i'm um, i'm used to a, a lot of uh, travel platforms but this one is is unique and uh, that's the reason i'm also a small angel investor into the company and i thought uh, why not learn from their experience through this podcast and share uh, it with with you all so in this conversation we are going to cover a lot of topics we could go all the way for 2 hours uh, if if everyone you agrees talking all about all day <laughs> all day talking about how the unravel idea germinated how was it validated how did the founding team come together when did they become serious about um, jumping into this letting go of their jobs we talk about the initial seed capital seed funding later we talk about equity split mentors advisors what are the psychological pressures of navigating uncertainty what were the opportunities what were the road bumps that they faced and also on the product side right so how did the development go um, metrics design team so this is going to be a deep dive on on their entrepreneurial journey till date so if you do not uh, want to sit in front of youtube and watch uh, you could also uh, take a stroll out and watch this on spotify as well as i said so with that let's let's welcome abhimanyu hi abhimanyu uh, welcome to uh, product lessons how are you doing today i'm great ravi thank you real privilege having you here and thank you for joining us on the journey of unravel yeah same here i i, I was i was quite excited and then we realized Abhimanyu is is a very good friend of a very good friend of mine. I mean, this was accidental. Okay, this was this this was this was even before I made a decision to to invest in in Unravel. Um, so Abhimanyu, um, why don't why don't you tell a bit about yourself? Just just for the audience to get a context. Where are you from? What what were your uh, how has your career turned so far? And before you jumped into Unravel. Sure, Ravi. Thank you. Um, I'll start from uh, education. I, I I was born and brought up in in Hyderabad, and uh, I had a love for maths from uh, the very early stages. I think my father sort of uh, drilled that into me, um, and I went to study in this place called the Indian Statistical Institute. Uh, <clears throat> and when I went there, I was convinced that i was one of the you know maths geniuses in the country <laughs> only to discover on day 1 that everybody around me was a nerd everyone around me was like a genius themselves so that brought me right back down to uh, ground level but all said and done uh, isi was one of the most fascinating phases of my life uh, there were very few people isi only accepts 20 people per batch wow. uh, and every one of them are exceptionally bright uh they they are people who are passionate about the subject rather than looking to you know uh you know kick off a career in um something in the future it's just people who are just crazy about numbers themselves so anyway it started there i um met vijay uh, who was my senior who actually ragged me uh in my first week uh <laughs> so Thank you. uh what's that he ragged you is it he he did he did, he he did try and drag me and then there were just too many uh, synergies or common loves you know starting with music to cricket to travel uh, and and we just gelled so strongly that from then we just became really close friends i, I still look at him as a senior of course but uh, we we gelled very 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 well from then so uh, that was isi and then um, back in those days ravi there was a field called i mean there still is uh, actuarial science uh which was very very lucrative for people from a maths and stats background uh because uh, you know every exam you clear your ctc actually went up by a bit 
So you're not just, uh, you know, you were not just uh, restricted by your performance in the company. There was another way of actually increasing your CTC. So it was very logical for me to follow that path. I started at Deloitte Consulting. We were a three-member team of advanced quantitative services. Um, But the work we did was predominantly predictive modeling, Uh, predictive modeling for pricing, uh, fraud, uh, claims management, uh, these kinds of things. And then two, three years down the line, we realized there's a lot more scope. There was this whole data science field emerging uh, with machine learning becoming mainstream. So we expanded big time. We produced solutions using machine learning for a lot of other clients as well, not just insurance. And over a decade, I think we grew that practice from three people to about 100 people. Um, this was <clears throat> 2018 or so. Um, and it, there, there were lots of milestones in between. I thoroughly enjoyed my journey, traveled a lot in between, as you can expect in a typical consulting role. And then, uh, you know, Vijay comes to me and seeds this idea of Unravel in 2020, uh, late 2020. And that's how uh, Unravel was, you know, first conceptualized. But, and yeah. and you also earned the reputation of being one of the uh, well-known data scientists in the country, right? You were listed in the top ten. Could you could you shed some light there? Uh, sure. Um, I I feel a little <laughs> embarrassed talking about it, so I try to leave that out. But thank you for bringing it up. Um, so in um, in Deloitte, we we also released a couple of uh, patents around the solutions we were building for especially claims management and fraud detection in insurance. Um, One of them was around uh, using um, uh, injury-based, so so in the US for all your, um, all the claims that you make, uh, what we have in India is called uh, Medicare. In the US, the equivalent of that is workers' compensation. Uh, and we were building solutions which used uh, their injuries, ICD-9 codes, uh, to actually segment them in a more fair but accurate way to predict losses for the future. Okay. Uh, and nobody had tried this before, partially because the idea didn't strike people, but also because insurance as an industry is very highly regulated. Uh, and uh, so we had to run some prototypes to uh, try and convince the regulators that this worked and it's accurate, and then uh, launched a patent. And the moment the you know the patent was filed, uh, we you know as you'd expect there was a stream of new customers, both large and medium scale insurance players coming in and trying to. So I had a big role to play in that, um, and it was because of my contributions there, and I brought that to outside the US as well to a lot of insurance clients. Um, uh, that, as well as other contributions, meant that, uh, you know, as early as 2016, I think it was, when uh, they, they recognized me among the top 10 data scientists in India. So, yeah. Lovely. So, uh, did, did your CTC go up soon after that? Like, did your market value just blew over? I... <laughs> uh, I, I wish I was smart enough to ca- cash in on that, Ravi, back then. I, I don't think I was. But okay. uh, no, I, I know that it it, uh, it it instantly got me, uh, got more people speaking to me. So in a consulting role, and by 2016, I was already leading the practice. Um, so it made it easier to have conversations with newer clients. I can say that much. Got it. So, so before you uh, unravel what unravel is, uh, I have I have this very impressive um, pitch of yours, pitch video of yours, which I would like to play for the audience, and then we can take sure. it from there. All right. So, share screen. All right. So this is the one that caught my attention and, and a lot of people here in uh, on, in uh, the investment community here. So let's play. Have you heard about News Yard in London? Probably not, but it's become the most popular tourist spot among millennials and Gen Z. Why? Because 90% of them travel to places they've seen on a TikTok or an Instagram video. In fact, TikTok over to Google for the first time ever as the most visited domain in the world in 2021. 
underlining why videos are the most preferred format of discovery today. Hi, I'm Abhi, co-founder of Unravel, the world's first smart travel app that leverages AI-based personalization and TikTok-style short-form videos that are compulsively snackable commercials of the world's most amazing experiences, just like Neil's Yard. Finally, a travel discovery platform that millennials and Gen Zs can relate to. Our platform uses AI to bring together the three core networks of travel so that everyone wins. Firstly, the traveler, because we're all inspired by stunning videos and want our vacations to look like that cool dude who just went there, right? Secondly, the content creators, because they earn royalties from bookings made on Unravel that they inspire, thereby creating a living out of the platform. And finally, the hotels, the vacation homes, the activity providers who want to give their customers a once in a lifetime experience that they can go tell their friends about. Unravel works because it's built by a team of award-winning designers and AI professionals who have solved discovery problems for travel giants like Emirates, Amex, Marriott, and many others. We launched our beta iOS app in December 21 and got instantly featured on the App Store's homepage for three straight months. We've got 6,000 users today with a 30-day retention rate of 52%, which is higher than even gaming apps and comparable to news apps. And all of that without spending any money on marketing. Why? Because we've got 200,000 followers of our own on our own social media channels who continuously make their way. We're looking for investor partners in our next round of fundraising. So come join us in this adventure. I promise a wide ride. So, so that was a that was a very very uh, good one. Uh, I, I've. I've interviewed the founder of Kickstarter and Kickstarter. Auf den um, yeah, Jan Stickler is the founder of Kickstarter. He was one of my guests. I had the privilege to talk to him. And yeah, so they, they would often make uh, for crowdsourcing such videos. So there was a good one. Um, my, my point is, Abhimanyu, when Vijay got, got in touch with you, did you have a conversation with him? How was the conversation then? Why was he so bullish about this idea, and what what um, what led him to to ask you and and others to join in this journey? Yeah, it it was um, it was the start of the pandemic, and I remember so so Vijay and I uh, because Vijay is married to my classmate as well, uh, so we've been thick friends like over the years. We travel a lot together, um, and very often uh, the way travel starts Ravi as I'm sure in your case as well right it's the vibes who sort of pick out uh, you know uh, really gorgeous stunning locations from social media and pass them on to you and say here's here's where you want to go next and uh, you know uh, 10 day trip you need to I need to do this exact thing and uh, you know uh, it, it has to have a photo and then so that after the trip we should be able to put these up on Instagram. Right. Uh, my wife is, you know, quite an avid traveler as well. So um, Vijay's original idea was he had recently sold a project to uh, a couple of big clients, including, if I can name them, American Express, where uh, he showed me, he sort of showed a, he shared screen and showed me a demo of the product. Uh, and it was a very simple interactive conversational AI bot, which asked you a simple set of questions and went ahead to book your entire vacation. Um, and, and I was dabbling with conversational AI as well. I was building something for a large US uh, telecom provider, but a very different use case. Vijay's use case was uh, Amex is this, has this whole luxury concierge, which uh, their service is outstanding, right? I mean, if you think about uh, travel concierges across the globe. Amex is by far the best. Uh, he was building this completely automated concierge for them. What, and, what, do you, uh, what do you mean by concierge, maybe? So concierge... Well, I understand concierge in, in a physical hotel space, but yeah. when, you, when you talk about Amex, digital space, what does a concierge mean? So uh, in the digital space, imagine there's a, a simple chat window, right? 
uh, most websites have it, most apps have it today. Um, the, the difference here is using a combination of uh, NLP-led conversations uh, as well as some visuals. Uh, this chat would serve as a digital concierge for you if you were, let's say, an Amex uh, Black customer or an Amex Elite customer. And uh, and so so the chat itself, he showed me one uh, visual prototype, and and he showed me that uh, they just as you call up Amex and they ask you they ask you a bunch of very nice questions to make you comfortable, then gradually take you into okay, so where are you planning to go? Where are you planning to stay? What would you like to do over there? And then I I see that in the past you've been here and done this. Would you like something similar? So the, it's not a it's not a first time conversation. It's a conversation with someone who seems to know you pretty well um, so his questions as well as his recommendations about where to stay uh, what to do are inspired by what you've done before right okay. so it's looking at your data in the back end it's trying to pull out the it, it it's very honestly not very difficult to do uh, so it's pulling out that data uh, quick quickly reading what's what your interest is and recommending three four ideas not more than that just three four the moment it goes beyond five or six, it becomes a challenge for you as a user to uh, pick the right one. So it's just three, four recommendations, knowing very well that one of those three will get selected. Uh, and it, you know, the, the chat ends when your whole trip has been planned out and booked out. You know, everything is happening at the back end. So he said, uh, this is 20% of what I want to do. Uh, but the 100% of this, I cannot build into a B2B. Uh, the hundred percent of this needs to be uh, out there for everyone to use. Why not, right? I mean, why, uh, why build something for a million people uh, when you can build the same thing for a billion people and uh, let everyone use it? Yes, it'll take time. It'll take a string of partnerships because we need to get the data. We need to get, but I can completely foresee this as being a, a full B two C product. Um, I, at that stage, told him, and this is after our usual casual chats, I told him, yeah, seems interesting, et cetera, but, you know, B2C startups. I, have, I had never even switched jobs before that. <laughs> so for me, uh, you know, I, the, the, the possibility of quitting your job and starting new was, was alien at that stage. But he structured out the next three months very, very well and made it easier for me as well as three others. We uh, we went in and uh, found Sunny, we found uh, Vashishta, we found Deva, we found Vridula, um, and these were all within our networks. Uh, he made it very easy for us in a very structured way to get to the prototype stage over a period of three months. So we would uh, sit every weekend um, and we would firstly draw out what the idea should be um, there's a lot of ton of material available on the internet to build customer journey maps and, and we used all of those we used we tried to use the best of those we spoke to a lot of previous uh, startup founders and every weekend we would basically sit and inch ahead in our journey and by the end of uh, three months i remember this was between may 2020 to uh, october august 2020 um, we built out a prototype of what Unravel should look like uh, in an app format. And we had already lined up 15 of our network people. So he had, I had worked with people at Marriott and Delta Airlines. He had worked with Amex and he had friends in the industry. Um, so we lined up these people. We set up calls with them. We asked them to be as candid as possible and not our uh, network people and give us candid feedback. And uh, somewhere, Ravi, I think along the journey, it was very easy for Sunny, Vashishta, me to take that jump because we had already become half invested in it, right? So mentally or psychologically, we, with every passing day, we were becoming convinced about the idea ourselves. So that's how it began. That's how it uh, started. But um, so... Did you did you have the business model figured out, like how how you are going to make money? I mean, you you created the prototype good, but did you did you also sketch out how you would be able to? Did you have the entire business model ready then, or were you aware on in bits and pieces on where it would be? 
Uh, we were pretty certain of the business model, I think, two months down the uh, road of building out the prototype. Uh, and it was uh, for for a couple of reasons. And I'll, I'll hit the first one first. The first is uh, travel itself, uh, pre-COVID, was a $1.5 trillion industry. And post-COVID, uh, digital travel, sorry, not even travel. Travel itself is 8 to $9 uh, trillion, but just digital travel alone is 1.5 uh, trillion. This is 2019 and early 2020. Uh, during COVID, uh, it uh, it basically came down to half. Uh, and everyone we studied, including Booking.com, uh, including uh, Expedia, every single annual statement we studied effectively told us that it had come down to half. Now, this would mean, uh, a few things. One is uh, business-wise, opportunity-wise, it would take three, four years for the industry to reach uh, the 1.5 trillion again. Uh, the second was that, and this is the more, more important one, because of COVID, the industry supply would come down to at least half. But we bet on the fact that eventually COVID would sort of, uh, you know, fade off. And Overnight, which is happening this year, actually, Ravi, where uh, travel is booming again. There's this whole uh, concept of hashtag revenge travel, right? Everyone's traveling. So the demand would go up to what it was naturally because, you know, uh, humans still want to travel. If anything, they want to travel even more. So the demand went up and the supply had halved. So there's practically a void of half the industry not being there when the demand goes up again. So that was the second big reason. Uh, and then, you know, of course, we we tried to analyze uh, where the experts were saying the industry would go for five years down the line. Opportunity wise, it was a no brainer. Coming to the business model. Um, yes, we recognized an opportunity in terms of bookings. But the kind of idea we were investing in uh, was we wanted actually this whole platform to self serve itself because we were thinking of uh, the inspiration uh, for videos. Most people, all of us travel today because we, saw, we see this amazing video on TikTok or Instagram. Um, we expected these videos to come from travelers themselves, and especially travelers who travel a lot, find those hidden gems and put them on social media. The other layer is the users. They're watching these videos and trying to uh, relive those moments for their own vacations. So um, because we wanted a platform that was two-way, we recognized that eventually uh, the business would be run not with us making bookings on the platform, but with us uh, enabling bookings, enabling newer places through ads uh, from tourism boards or hotels who wanted to position themselves a little more strongly. So uh, that was the model. That is actually the model we are banking on, uh, the ad spend one. Uh, it's not not technically rocket science once you have traffic. Most social media platforms do that. Did you have any existing player who was at least near to how you were imagining Unravel to be? Existing player in video, no, uh, because nobody i think the, the whole idea of video led travel inspiration was just starting to take shape uh tiktok suddenly boomed instagram was always there but instagram suddenly invested in instagram reels uh but before that instagram was all images right so video led inspiration there was nobody um and but image led inspiration there were plenty of them. Um, I, I, I think uh, we took initial inspiration, of course, from the bigger players, the TikToks and the, uh, the Pinterest. We, we love Pinterest. We're big fans of Pinterest. We think uh, it's a highly underrated app. Um, so initial inspiration for Pinterest. But we also found a couple of others like Stellar and Pluto. Uh, we have a list of Sunny has Sunny, who's our chief product officer, has a list of eighty-five startups, uh, both in the video and travel space that we follow very closely, and we try to learn from. Uh, Stellar and Pluto were right up there because they were trying to evangelize the concept of video, video led inspiration from, from creators as well. They were doing it slightly differently, though. They were not 
taking you, they were just feeding you inspiration and leaving it there. Uh, we wanted to make it wholesome, meaning if you watch a video and if you're excited, if you're, uh, you know, inspired at that moment, you want to act at that moment. That's what the generation today wants to do. So we wanted to take it all the way up to uh, booking as well as, you know, make the uh, make the whole travel, the, the vacation real. Got it. Um so you said 85, 85 uh, startups already there, which your CPO uh, made a list of. Um, yep. The thing is, when you when you when you're making a life decision, right? So where you want to like, if you want to go all in, that means you are committing your next say five, ten years into this idea. Um, what what is the framework that you use? Is this is this something I'm, I'm sure because there are so many people impacted your family is impacted you, you, you need to convince your uh, wife and if in, if you're an indian you need to convince your parents if this oh, is yeah. the right thing on. so what clicked for you uh, to make this massive life decision because as you said you had not uh, ever uh, changed your jobs before and this is this is not about changing jobs but but about starting something from from fresh what 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 was that one thing that led you to believe uh, this um i i think you've covered a part of it ravi uh firstly very very valid question mm. uh because and i'll add in-laws as well in-laws and extended family to this list as well yeah, uh so, <laughs> so i'm sitting there right now so i have to be honest uh mm. so um first and foremost i needed to be convinced if if i wasn't convinced 100 percent obsessed with the idea even uh, then I, I didn't want to put up a uh, put up a face or put up a case in front of them. Uh, so I think I was convinced two months into trying to build the prototype. Uh, I'm 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 a I've usually been risk averse. Uh, two months into the pro- prototype, I was convinced. Only then did I broach the subject with them. You you were convinced uh, about about what about the potential of this. I was convinced about me wanting to quit everything else and do this. Um, uh, I was convinced about the idea, whether I wanted to jump in and quit my, uh, I think the word is uh, decade long social capital in my previous company and my uh, network of clients, but I wanted to even put all of that behind and jump into this took took me two months, two months to sort of uh, be 100% sure. Uh, whether I wanted to jump into this because I had also seen a lot of people do this part time uh, over weekends and you know, but yeah, the this entire, was not entire COVID phase resulted in in a in a side gig economy in a side gig exactly exactly and uh, uh, yeah I know a whole other topic right Ravi I mean that's a that's a challenge for some of us uh, in these bigger organizations where everyone's doing that but anyway uh, so uh, I didn't want to. Uh, spend like half my time doing this or 20% of my time doing this. I wanted to spend 100% of my time doing this. That that conviction came, uh, I think, in July of 2020, two months into trying to build this out. Um, the second layer was uh, the people. I've not mentioned him yet, uh, but one of the big inspirations here was uh, my batchmate from ISA, Prashant, who was eventually our first seed investor. You met him on that one call, I think. Um, and by then, Prashant had taken the leap himself and uh, and and set up a hugely successful uh, high frequency trading firm. Um, and he played a big role in, in convincing me as well. Uh, the second layer was the team, the people. Were these people? I forget the idea. The idea is, you know, in, you know, in its own ways. Uh, something you believe you want to bet on, et cetera. But is this the core of people I want to, uh, you know, spend 100% of my day with? Can I can I add value to this team? And can they can we together make A plus B square uh, happen? Uh, I think the people was the most important part, uh, secondly. When I was convinced about these two, uh, then I went ahead and made the proposition. And of course, like I would to any client, I, I created a business case. I showed them the future. I predicted future financials. I projected the role and why it was uh, mentally far more satisfying. I think the 
COVID scenario made it easier because previously they had seen me go about travel so much, interact with people uh, that now when I was telling them, I am personally happier doing this, uh, it required less convincing. I'm sure one or two years earlier, if I had tried to convince them, it would have been a tougher job. But during COVID, all of us became sensitive to people's innermost desires, right? Uh, what people really want to do. Um, and it, it became easier to convince them. So it uh, wasn't easy. Uh, lots of conversations, lots of pros and cons. And my wife, incidentally, was also in the same company. That's where I met her. Um, but it probably helped that she was going through some similar uh, feelings about her own career as well. So that uh, that made it easier. And um, similar, <clears throat> excuse me, similar, uh, I'm sure I, I can speak for the others, Vijay, Sunny, um, Vashishta, I can speak for them. I know that as we went along during the prototype over those weekends, I think all of us started to sense that you know, we loved working with each other. And I think it was very important to go through that realization uh, before taking a leap of faith like this. Got so, it. I don't know if that fully answers your question. Yeah, but, 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 but the, the very important, the crux of this decision is financial planning, right? So you have a safe yeah. job. Did you, like, I, I do not know, uh, primarily uh, Indians especially, uh, soon after they have a job, they, they have a house loan, there are there are these responsibilities, people, people have kids. How did you plan your plan your financials? Maybe shed some light there. Uh, to, to be fair, I know you, you are an expert. And uh, in this space, my wife is the expert. Uh, so she does all of it and she ensured it. Uh, I had a baby coming. Thankfully, uh, the loans were minimal. minimal. Um, I gave myself, and and it wasn't <clears throat> wasn't as if I, I I think in my case it was a little easier because I'd worked for so long and I had a few savings. My wife had a few savings. Even though we had a baby along the way, we were well settled here in in Gurgaon. Uh, we had a house. My parents were living with me. Her parents were an hour away. So everything was actually very, the support system was sort of already there in my own case. Uh, I didn't really have to strive to put that in place before taking a leap like this. Uh, financially speaking, uh, it was a simple calculation of looking at what would be my uh, you know, medium term requirements. By medium term, I mean that I, I am not going to compromise on the quality of life my family has. Uh, I'm not going to compromise on the requirements that my baby has in the first, at least, say, a year or two. Um, what does that add up to? What does it mean in terms of an expense over the next two, three years? It's a very simple calculation. It didn't take us long to figure it out. Um, and uh, that was the finan financial side of, uh, of things. And, of course, we had savings. And I had saved up a little in Hyderabad as well, which was where I grew up. Uh, and, you know, push comes to shove, uh, there is that, uh, you know, there is that saving, there's that uh, property as well. So uh, with a medium term wealth planned out uh, and a few, a couple of sort of uh, 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 just in case we need something scenarios, you know, a couple of such things to help out, uh, it was an easier decision. Uh, but if you're asking me how long uh, I calculated for, for this to sort of be okay without a steady job, uh, I was looking at a time period of three to four years, uh, not beyond that, admittedly. I would advise very strongly that uh, uh, anyone in my age uh, doing the same should probably forecast the same. Because, uh, and, and you'd be the right person, Ravi, to shed light on this. Startups... Any startup, especially a B2C startup, uh, I think needs to have that run. We uh, we cannot expect it to take off. And I, I know there are counter examples last year in the Indian startup ecosystem, but I think you need to give yourselves uh, three to four years at least before knowing that, uh, you know, whether this is going to work, not work, whatever it is. But that's a minimum time frame and persistency is the key. Uh, did you have 
capital to invest into this uh, into the startup initially like uh, did you pull in money or how, how did it work i know you are in angel round now but the the yeah. early the first uh, capital seed capital the seed capital came largely from prashant uh, prashant and vijay and uh, prashant was already doing uh, uh, amazingly well with uh, quantbox and uh, he was bullish on an idea that needed to be a, a 10 billion dollar idea not uh, um, not a 100 million dollar idea and we're looking many years into the future of course uh, so the large part of the seed capital came, came from him uh, and he wanted to be very clear that this is uh, you know i'm happy to ensure that you go for a good 18 month uh, runway 18 to two year runway at least at the very least with this and you know i am uh, completely behind first and foremost you guys uh, your team uh, and secondly the idea itself so should should there be a situation where you know we're facing a crunch no matter what uh, then i'm i'm going to come in and that's how prashant became a co-founder as well because a lot of the uh, ideas as well um, both in the ideation stage and the prototyping stage prashant was a huge part of it and during the execution when we were building out the infrastructure because that's his uh, that's one of his strengths is that's one of the strengths of which quantbox also works the low latency nature of it um he he had a big role to play so that seed capital originally came from him uh, another principle we adopted ravi in our very early stages is we don't want to be a company uh, that uh, is uh, sort of worried about raising money in our product development stage, in our execution stage. Um, we want it to be as thorough and as polished as possible. And you'll see that in the product we've built uh, as possible and not make something in haste and then go to a uh, VC, try to raise some money. We, we wanted to test it out. We went through, uh, internally, I think we went through five variations of the product before uh, making it public earlier this year. Um, and it's, it's not because, you know, we've got it right the first time. I don't think anybody does. Uh, we went through multiple iterations, tested it out with a private set of beta testers, uh, alpha testers, beta testers, um, made modifications and Prashant gave us the assurance that, you know, while you're doing this, I don't want you to be thinking about, uh, trying to raise capital and we, we stuck to that. So that was so, the initial thought process. So the initial, uh, seed capital was, was spent on what? So when you said 18 months runway, um, uh, runway spent on what? So um, everything from bringing the team together, um, when we started uh, prototyping it, we were five people. Um, and these five people jumped on board after the prototype was validated. And we sort of were convinced, we were all, like I was telling you, we were all convinced about the idea. We had validated it with a few, excuse me, industry experts, as well as what we potentially foresaw as socially conscious travelers who would use a product like this um initial seed capital early days uh, getting the team together so hiring a lot of recruitment um, we had uh, networks of uh, people in both design developer but mostly the data uh, community because all of us came from a background in data science uh, it wasn't easy to convince people, as you can imagine. Uh, it was by far one of the biggest hurdles to uh, to convince people to join us. So I think we we spent enough time to ensure that people who were taking the jump like us were a financially secure uh, and b highly engaged even before they joined us. Uh, we spend a lot of time on that and and therefore uh, you could say a lot of money as well um then was the software side of things now luckily for us uh you know back when we were starting our careers ravi building out a software or a product like this would have taken a lot today everything is considerably easier everything is democratized from your cloud infrastructure to um 
libraries in in codes uh, we had to stitch a lot of these together and create wherever it was necessary but as a startup we wanted to be in a agile hustle mentality so we sort of picked up stuff from you know we, we researched a lot read a lot we tried not to replicate things that were already done so i would say the expenses for software were only uh, frugally used where it was really necessary and i'll tell you a couple of scenarios where it was really necessary one was uh, there is this really nice digital management tool called Canto, uh, which allows you to very easily add uh, tags to a video automatically, program it, uh, merge it with your Dropbox folder, your Google Drive folders, and then automatically pass it on to your S3 buckets for the app to sort of ingest those videos. Uh, even though I say so publicly, Canto is expensive, but we wanted to invest. We spent a lot of time looking at it. We uh, researched other competitor tools. We knew that Canto would ease up our job considerably, so we spent on it. Uh, then were the partnerships. Um, now, to build a social video shoppable platform, uh, we had to get content, right? So we spent a lot of time building a partnership with Lonely Planet because we knew that uh, we, we wanted everything on our product to be licensed, every single thing. And I can proudly say, Ravi, that every single thing on our platform is either licensed or originally curated by us, from videos to written text, to captions, to inventory. Uh, what, there's, what, do you there's mean, not... what, what do you mean by everything was, was licensed and why it is so important? It is critically important because in today's day and age, Pulling off content from the net is is a two minute job. I can go through videos on Instagram and TikTok and download them. There are enough softwares. You don't even have to sort of write a code to do it. Enough softwares that will help you download those videos. Uh, there's, we all did this. There's enough things you can write to crawl uh, data about certain destinations about. So if you, if you go to, to our app, the first thing you see is videos. Those videos could come from anywhere. On our platform, every single one of those videos is directly licensed from the creator. Uh, we uh, we we get we extract those uh, content. Uh, we get the content directly from them. We take the permission to actually edit it and add licensed music on it, not mainstream music, because mainstream music is not licensed. Sony charges you somewhere around uh, fifty thousand for an annual license of a hundred mainstream. Uh, music pieces. You there? Sorry, I think I was frozen for a minute. No. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so Sony is expensive, but we made the contact through a friend in in Dubai to try and get that too. But we didn't spend there because it was going to be expensive. We spent we spent money on Epidemic and Artlist and uh, you know royalty free music basically. So the video you see on our app, the music that you see, every the music is licensed. The video is licensed. You click and, on the and, app, yeah. and, it was, and it was making financial sense to license uh, original content. You, oh yeah, yeah, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, because because down the line, Ravi, if uh, I mean, if if you're pulling content from uh, publicly available apps or sites, um, you know you'll be in trouble very soon. You know, before you uh, hit it big, you, it's it's a matter of time. And and GDPR, especially in Europe, is extremely extremely strict. So uh, we didn't want to get, to get into any any of that. So from the videos to the music to the written content, which is coming from Lonely Planet subsidiary uh, arrival guides, um, to the inventory, which is coming from Viator activities are coming from Viator. Homes are coming from Plum Guide. Hotels are coming from Booking.com. Every single one of these is licensed. Um, so we spent a ton of time building these partnerships, building these relationships with these larger players. Um, it required us to get on an insane number of calls, showing them our prototype, because by then we didn't have a product built out yet. But we showed them the prototype, and we convinced them. We showed them our own backgrounds and convinced them, You know, built that trust over time. And initially, it was very tough, but over a period of time, it became much, much easier. Uh, because a good example is uh, the strategy followed with content creators. 
we went after the biggest of them first. Uh, it took us a month or two to convince Hobo Piba to partner with us. Hobo Piba has got, I think, three, four million followers. He's uh, so this... Those are not familiar, including me. Uh, who is Hobo Piba? Hobo Piba is an influencer, travel influencer on TikTok and Instagram. Uh, uh, yes. I, last I checked, she had like three, four million followers in both these platforms. And uh, she puts out these amazing videos of places she visits. She and her partner, um, they travel and they have sometimes, uh, they, they're very professional. They're uh, they're not just any travel influencers. They're just very, very professional uh, video videographers and photographers. Um, so we went after her first. Um, A, because her content was, you know, we, we, we wanted to sort of, that's her, yes. Um, we, we wanted to um, uh, instill or we wanted to trigger wanderlust in people with the very best of content. Um, and the moment we signed her on, uh, and her partner, Dimitri, is the person who sort of interacts with us, we, the moment we signed them on, uh, it was easier to convince others uh, so next was uh, Voyage Fox. Voyage Fox is again a couple, Natalie and Patrick. So how did you um, how, how did you convince them? What how, how did you influence them to to join you? What? We showed the prototype. So we 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 showed them uh, very simply that hey, this is the idea we have, and uh, you know the idea is that there needs to be a platform where. <clears throat> To today, uh, th think of a typical travel influencer's uh, lifestyle, Ravi. It's it's a lot of fun, but it's it can be pretty tough as well. They travel the whole world across the year, um, taking a few breaks in between. Their itinerary is determined by who invites them to cover content in their locations or destinations. Typically, these are hotels or tourism boards. Um, who pay them to fly into that country or the hotel? spend a few days, shoot the best parts of the place, enjoy amazing dinners, uh, shoot the content quickly, hand over the content, post it on their platforms, and then tata bye bye. Some of them even sign up to be like annual advisors to these people. Uh, but that's it. That's their, they're essentially freelancing, um, you know, freelance content creators who have a huge following and, th and that's why they get invited. It's very lucrative, but imagine in a time like COVID, where no one's traveling, uh, a lot of a lot of them faced a lot of difficulties because these people had given up day jobs uh, to travel the world. They were following their passion, but they didn't have a steady stream of revenue. So our uh, pitch to them was: today you earn entertainment value from a YouTube or an Instagram or a TikTok, and your other earnings come from when people invite you over. On our platform, you're going to earn lifetime royalty from inspirations you provide. So um, any video that is inspiring a traveler to book that hotel, you will earn a 5% commission. Um, they said, OK, wow, sounds, sounds super interesting, but how will you make it happen? How much time? And we told them, this is, <clears throat> you know, we're building the product. It'll take time, but here's what it looks like. Here's the prototype. Um, and so initially, we offered to pay a fixed cost for their videos. And we put we took them in bulk for destinations that we were targeting, especially in Europe. Over time, and, and we didn't just stop at that one transaction. With Hobo Piva, for example, uh, we've had, I think, 10 to 12 different sets of videos coming in. Because now, wherever she travels, she sort of gives us an indication that, hey, I'm going here. Is there a specific place you want me to cover? So over a period of time, uh, this transitioned from uh, fixed cost videos to royalty generating videos. And we showed them real life examples that, hey, if, if, you were to, if I were to pay you amount X for your video, that X in two to three years can be a hundred X based on bookings inspired by this video. And I'm not kidding. I, I, I created a whole story. I mean, illustration of the, the, why that is the case, the maths behind it. Um, so they understood the math, but to be convinced of time, 
but once hobo piba was on board voyage fox florina 15 20 others came on board uh, a lot more easily and uh, today they're they be themselves are very big believers in the vision as well so which was very important for us got it um, you mentioned about uh, building the team and you said uh, we wanted people to be financially secure and hi- highly engaged uh, yeah. <clears throat> first of all uh, what went into picking the the right people so which which roles were important for you at that stage of, <clears throat> of the company and then uh, you you are saying if they had to be financially secure so obviously you cannot pay them uh, market price what took you to influence them to join in this journey like was it a promise of equity was it like maybe you can shed some light there this is an interesting uh, thing ravi so uh, if you're familiar with um, the startup ecosystem in india it's really boomed in the last two years with a lot of vc money coming in um so whether for the right reasons or the wrong reasons uh more and more people on the engineering side have become uh are are more um attracted by the promise of money rather than equity interestingly enough um and and of course there's a side gig always available so many of them are doing multiple things at the same time um i i i'll, I'll divide the recruitment into three parts part one where it was easiest for us was the data and uh, intelligence of so the data science and ai kind of network there we were like convinced that we didn't need to we need we didn't need outside help um i used to lead a team that was filled with superstars vijay sunny came from those backgrounds in their mckinsey and ibm days uh, so we uh, so we found a couple of really strong people already that was the easier part and they were part of our very early founding team vashishta and deva who have mentioned before uh then came the difficult part of design none of us had uh you know we had not led design teams we worked with designers before but even while working with designers before we not worked with b2c designers uh so we needed to find someone and we found uh one guy ashwin who was uh who came from uh, make my trip uh, flipkart sorry flipkart and uh, he had briefly worked for i think make my trip as well um we needed that experience and then later on when we were looking at uh pulling in a graphic designer we found stuti uh, and stuti had been working with bloom hotels so she sort of understood the whole hospitality industries uh design sentiments um when we were looking for design talent uh we also looked at a couple of people from ukraine and we brought on board Uh, a lady named Dasha uh two reasons why we hired Dasha uh one was we wanted our design sentiment to reflect uh not just a southeast asian or an asian uh mentality in in the whole uh, you know video and travel space we wanted someone to challenge that thought process so so Dasha was an important person purely because of the background she possessed purely because of the place she came from the culture she came from but also because dasha was like a uh, an award winning designer in ukraine she was uh, she had she was now in the expert panel of there's this national design competition ukraine holds every year and dasha had won that previously and was now acting in, in their panel of judges so uh, we liked her approach ashwin was very impulsive dasha was extremely data driven so we had sort of a nice uh, you know professional marriage of these two design components stuti was sort of building out if you see our unravel language and design there's a lot of thought given to why the colors are like that it reflects the colors of you know the aqu- aquatic uh, ocean landscape and beaches uh, so stuti brought that alive with her graphic design dasha and ashwin brought that out in the product itself uh, so that was design um and then comes the engineering component uh the development right you you you're back in and front end developers and uh, we were trying to build out the creator side of the dashboard first you know uh, so that influencers can upload their content 
and start to study how that content was doing on the app. And we were doing this on a website. We weren't building out the app side of things. Uh, we had, uh, through a friend of ours, we had identified a couple of developers who were doing this. The idea was entirely out. We, we had designed it. But we found that during, you know, every time we challenged to, them to do something different, something complex, uh, they went back to this one guy, these couple of guy named, guys named Zishan and uh, Vikash. Uh, so we asked them, who are these guys? And why do you keep going back to them? I said, oh, these are, you know, our, we have this whole community of developers and these are our sort of uh, leaders. So everyone, every time someone has a problem, we go reach out to them. So that led us to Vikash and Zishan. And we then reached out to them. Uh, we said, okay, forget hiring from outside. We need these guys on board. And so we started talking to them. We, we asked them to build out a couple of parts of the app. And we loved what we saw. They were fast. They were innovative. And you know how Indians have that jugaad mentality uh, of getting things done? Very necessary for a startup in its early days. And, and they had the ability to sort of convert anything. You give them anything, even today. Even though today we are a much more well-oiled machine as a unit. But, but back then, I remember we would give them and they would sort of churn it out in, in a matter of days. So next up was convincing Vikash and Zishan. Uh, how did we convince them? Yes, there was part uh, ESOPs and there was part salary. We could, not, uh, we could not sort of compromise on their salary levels. So I can safely say, Ravi, that uh, nobody's um, salary levels were strictly compromised we recognized that uh, you know that is a need and that was the the whole environment of the indian startup ecosystem we couldn't afford to just tell them that hey here's a bunch of esops and can you compromise on the salary i i, I wouldn't I, I think we face that and i wouldn't advise uh, doing that unless it's um, you know there's someone who's financially so secure that they're willing to take that upside bet um, so that's how Vikas and Zishan came on board. And we got uh, Abhishek from the back end. We got Gaurav on our front end. And I think we were finally a full team, like a complete team by May or June of 2021. And how, so, how big was the team? So the full team was how many people now? We have 15 people uh, full time. And uh, we have uh, Midula was there on the content side from the very beginning. So she was one of our earliest. Middle is someone who's worked extensively with digital startups before. She's written a lot for them. Uh, so she was the easiest to sort of bring on board because she recognized the challenges of a startup ecosystem. Uh, and she was more excited about the idea. The other reason why it was easy to convince her was because Midla herself is like this travel nomad. She's, uh, you know, we, we all have, you know, Ravi homes where we live and we trying to raise families and doing a job. Midla is this whole, you know, bohemian spirit. She travels, she's usually in Thailand or some hidden part of the world, working from there, exploring on her own. So convincing her, her about Unravel was by far the easiest job. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she brought on board uh, uh, Shubha, who's not full time with us, but Shubha is an accomplished published author. Uh, so a lot of the captions on the videos, which are pretty cool and quirky, right? Those come from Shubha. The language and tone on the branding comes from Vidula and Stuti. Um, so these, there was uh, the content and creative side as well. So together, 15 people, I think we came together physically for the first time in October. We tried to bring everyone to Delhi. We really gelled and launched our first beta product end of November. Um, so that was, and that's how it stayed till then. We've not really tried to expand. We've wanted to be lean, uh, that, but we wanted to be complete. Okay. No, I, I love the fact that, okay, you had your uh, seed capital taken care of without compromises because it does not work in the long run. Uh, the, the team breaks if they're not happy. So you need to ensure that you have good, uh, uh seed capital for at least a year or so to, to build the product without compromise. And you said that right. even the business model was not compromised to you. You did not want to scrape free data. You wanted to license it. So you want to build the right foundations so that it is taken seriously. Um, yeah. the, 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 the challenge with B, B2C always is uh, there is 
less uh, loyalty there is absolutely zero loyalty from customers right so if uh, which is different from B2B. That is in B2B, there is more stickiness. Um, how do you account for uh, this lack of loyalty? Because people tend to shift whoever offers a bit better experience and a, and a better product. How do you account for this risk in uh, taking a bet on a B2C product like this? Yeah, that's where Vijay's sort of <clears throat> marketing genius comes into play. So Vijay was chief sales officer just before he moved to Unravel. He was chief sales officer at Creon Data, which is also a successful startup based out of Singapore and UK. And he said that unlike how most products do it, we have to start building a community before we even launch our product. Most of us didn't quite get the concept. I mean, how do you build a legion of following without actually having a product out there? And he said that uh, he'd been he'd been an Instagram influencer himself. So Vijay's part time hobby is also uh, still photography. He's got 10, 10 12 thousand followers on Instagram, and uh, so he knew how social media worked uh, in a personal sense. And he said, "We have to build a following because." Um, Ultimately, you're giving an experience through a product that feels an extent feels like an extension of TikTok and Instagram. It should not feel any different. So if you and I go on to unravel, it should I should, you know, continue to do this. And and this is this is a word of advice for any startup thinking of the B2B space today. I mean, whether you're news, whether you're finance, if you're if you don't have videos and if you don't have this, and if you're expecting people to type things out you're so five years old man uh, so um he said in order to build that community we have to start before we launch our product and we have to do that on social media so he started um, one of the um, investments we made was in trying to get one person one intern in uk and one intern here in india manage our social media channels um and um we started this, I, I forget the exact date, but I think we started this in the early part of 2021. We started to post, so all the videos we were uh, getting, raw videos we're getting from our content creator partners, uh, we started to curate them and put, post them on our social media channels. Uh, why? Because we're trying to get people to use, you know, get used to the, those kinds of uh, videos, those kinds of travel videos, and many other players, by the way. but. If you see our editing and if you see the kind of videos we focus on, they are meant to drive a booking intent. They're not meant to drive a, oh, this is a nice, good looking video and I'll swipe up again. They're meant to instill that feeling of, oh, what if I could go there uh, in you? So all of our videos, you track, trace back our entire Instagram feed or TikTok feed are meant to do just that. And these are again, licensed videos, no copying from anywhere, no downloading from anywhere else licensed videos from our content creators we started doing that earlier in 2021 over a period of time uh almost you know surprisingly but organically uh, today we stand at like 200,000 followers of these now the expectation is that these 200,000 uh and especially after we launch android as well are going to make their way into the app the moment they feel the urge that they want to go to these places and plan easily, you know, book easily. So uh, the loyalty factor that you asked about, Ravi, comes from, from there, getting them used to a certain style of continuously swiping up, uh, bookmarking ideas, and being able to book that very easily. Uh, also, uh, not yet happened, but will happen, is if you use the app, uh, most travel platforms today start, like you said, start from scratch. So if I have booked uh, a vacation in um, uh, in Prague uh, last year, and I want to book a vacation in Berlin this year, um, no travel platform will recognize that you've been to Prague and this is what you did. And no, plat no, no travel platform will actually look at your browsing behavior on Instagram or TikTok but Unravel will. So the next time you plan your vacation, after you've planned and browse on Unravel, the app will recognize your intent. It will recognize you're typically looking for kids' adventures. You're typically looking for a slightly more relaxed pace of your holidays. 
that is the advantage of advantage of loyalty and over a period of time if it's going to take away all the hassles of you having to start from scratch mm-hmm. and with an app constantly learning over you uh then you will want to go back to it and uh, you know keep browsing and keep planning so that is the that is where the loyalty and trust will come from uh the second factor and i'll just close with this is uh we all follow influencers today uh we have our favorite influencers we follow on instagram somewhere uh brand loyalty may take years to build but people's loyalty and trust you already have so ravi if you are going somewhere today and i know you and i trust your vacation plans and i like to replicate what you how you travel right if you are on unravel and if i'm seeing that this is what you did in prague right. uh then i i will have no hesitation to sort of replicate that and that's what unravel allows you to allows you to follow and travel like the influencer who's showing you the video does it also have an element of personalization because no matter how much i am uh, convinced about an influencer yeah my itinerary is going to be mine right so so my my choices are very unique every every yes. person choices how does how does that get accounted into your uh, app so first first and foremost is when you open the app you're swiping up right um videos that you swipe up or videos we have data to actually support this there's this um there's this guy from indianapolis who's been to our app 200 times in the last 45 years okay wow. uh, we have theories about who he is but we don't know who he is um but in those 200 odd sessions hmm. it is abundant abundantly clear about the kind of videos he likes watching because we know that he spends uh, there are certain videos he watches in loop there are certain videos he just doesn't watch he just swipes up right so that is a huge tell on what you're looking for or what at least what excites you the next level of tell is on the video screen there are three four buttons cta's the first of which is the big green explore now and the moment you click that if it's a hotels video you're watching you start to see a hotels page which has curated information from uh, apis that we've partnered up with uh reviews from condenast reviews from uh users on google more videos of that place it's trying to compel you as to why you want to book that place so this guy's seen a few of those he's not seen that for all those videos and then he saved a few videos for him to come back and see them again he shared a few videos with friends that he wants his friends to see or maybe his co-travelers to see all of these data points come together to tell me more about this guy let's call him x okay. from indianapolis right. he's seen 200 videos i know what he's seen how much he's seen or i know what he shared i know what type of videos he's sharing i know which ones he's clicked the cta on i know what type of itinerary he's tried to create all of this is uh, a very rich information for me to create a profile of yours and segment segment you into certain types of categories i won't reveal how many categories we have of personalization but the moment i am able to successfully do or categorize you or personalize you into a pro, uh, in a persona type i know what you want at least at a surface level and then i'm able to recommend you videos and places and destinations and trips or create your trips accordingly so a trip for you to berlin or prague will look very different for a trip from a trip from me to berlin and prague because let's say you might have uh, you you might be more interested in history i might be more interested in arts and culture um, so that will come into play in your feed it will come into play in uh, hotel recommendations activity recommendations home recommendations as well as item curation so there is an element of personalization from the very beginning to your entire experience got it um so this is this is about building loyalty with the customers um how about um competitors like over time i'm not now over time what is it that you are building that is strengthening your competitive moat what would what would that do uh so it's an it's an interesting question because ravi we are we are in competition with not just the travel platforms 
but if you think about it, we are competing for uh, minutes or seconds in everyone's daily life from the Netflix and the TikTok and the Instagrams as well, right? So, um, so, so competition is is sometimes a two way answer for me. So I'll I'll try and break it up into both those. Yeah, I, with, I meant with, I meant what is the moat? What is the moat that you are creating uh, against yeah. competition? So the the whole idea of uh, if if you look at uh, Generation Z today, Gen Z today, uh, they are not people who want to uh, keep quiet, and they are not people who are restricted by a single day job. They're looking for avenues to show off themselves as well as capitalize and monetize those. I think our platform is the only one that allows them to do that just now. For anyone else to come in and build something similar will take a lot of time to get all the partnerships in place as well as the IP uh, coding codes in place to tie up all of them and serve it in a personalized uh, fashion. Sure. Um, and I, I, I can't think of anyone else who's doing 40% of that today. So that will undoubtedly hold us in strong stead over the next, let's say, two to three years. Now. What we foresee beyond that is, see, over a period of time, tech gets easier. Um, like I was saying, right, 10 years back, if I were to build the same product, I would have had to go from door to door, knocking on people's door, allowing me access to this thing. APIs were not that common. So I fully envisioned that five years down the line, building Unravel will take lesser time. But by then, we will have a, a network or a community that will be considerably a million times harder to replicate. So it'll start with what we built over the next few years. It will grow into what we have. Uh, and of course, there'll be evolutions in the product as well. Okay. How do you how do you come up with milestones for your uh, for your startup? Um, say, okay, you, you invested in the product, but that is a continuous job. Okay, the, the product Correct. to be invested. But then you also need to draw a line saying that, okay, this is the point where we are confident of uh, now making making a buzz uh, outside. And the milestones could also be uh, uh, revenue milestones. Uh, milestones could also be um, fundraising milestones. So how, do you, how did you decide the different stages of, of your journey? Maybe. Sure. Excellent question, Ravi, because... Um... You know, earlier, we, when, when we worked in these larger organizations, they were, uh, they would trickle down from, let's say, the CEO and, you know, you would be given goals and targets and a lot easier then, right? Here, we are setting the goals. Um, so I think it was always necessary to have a slightly longer term vision, but not get too carried away by it. Uh, because you don't want to foresee or you don't want to predict something that's too far out in the future and work towards that. So it's very necessary for you to keep it real. Um, so yes, we have a vision, uh, but we have a constantly evolving mission of what we want to do in the next six months. And that mission is broken down to, into what we call OKRs. Uh, and the OKRs concept is something we adopted very early. Uh, we run OKRs every quarter, every three months. Uh, Better part of last year, Ravi, was focused on product development, as you can imagine. So we would have OKRs, company-level OKRs, um, that the three or four of us would sit and draw out for the next three months, and as well as why those were the OKRs. Um, and then those company OKRs were given to the lead within each vertical. And we were asked, we, they were then asked that, hey, these are your your certain you know your specific segments okrs break them out into your team's okrs and tell us which one's achievable which one's not achievable what's doable what's not doable so um while we decided the company level okrs for every quarter i think we wanted to empower the team to sort of challenge themselves and uh take ownership of their own okrs so that was broken down into team level and also in certain days, on certain occasions, individual OKRs. Um, this is a process we adopted, I think, early last year, early 2021. Uh, and we've tried to maintain that ever since. Uh, complete full disclosure, we've not always met our OKRs every, every three months, but we've learned from it. 
Um, the better part of 21 was focused on product and a little bit of social media, uh, as well as a lot of partnerships and, and getting those in place. The better part of 2022 is now that we are publicly launched, We uh, it's been two months now since we've launched. So a lot of our KPIs, core KPIs, are more market driven, uh, a little bit revenue driven. I wouldn't say revenue is a core part of um, what we uh, intend to gain in the shorter term, but it's a necessary hygiene uh, factor. We're more excited because we're data geeks. A lot of the KPIs are centered around uh, obviously how many people are coming in. And so far, you know, we've only got organic installs on our iOS app. But how many how many are coming back on a regular basis? Uh, are they coming back very frequently? Why are they coming back? What are they doing when they come back? Uh, but at a very basic level, how many are coming? Uh, and also, uh, first layer of the funnel, right? So there's video. Next layer is video to booking page, booking page to finally booking. If those are the broad three levels, then how many are coming in here? How many are going to the next level? How many are going a level below that? Uh, so far, we've observed that this top layer to the next layer is conversion rate is typically 40%. And uh, we honestly don't know if 40% is the right number because there's no benchmark to compete it against. What we do know is when we started off, that number was 8%. Mm. So based on so and we have a friday meeting for the entire company where our product team presents these numbers you know for everyone to sort of absorb and digest and go with the journey and uh, this number was eight percent and then the design team went back and made some very small changes to the design of the buttons on the video and the eight percent became twelve percent Nice. And then, then we sort of made a few more changes to the recommendation engine driving the feed, and the twelve percent became twenty percent. So uh, these are core metrics we follow, and a lot of our sprint decisions, sprint targets, are determined based on what these data, is, what this data is telling us. Uh, that's the stage we are in right now. Last year, same time, I, I don't think we had so much data to work on, so it was more like building out a software or a product getting the right pieces together. Now it's it's completely data-driven uh, in terms of what we have. And yes, there are a few other product development milestones as well, because uh, as you know, we don't have an Android app launched yet. So mm -hmm. we're trying to launch Android very quickly. Uh, also, we're uh, very, very intent on making the hotel booking in-app, uh, which today redirects you to uh, a partner. Uh, we already have Amadeus's API onboarded. We're building that out. So there are, it's, I think it's split it between 40 to 50% of what was already planned and the remaining 40 to 50% of what the data is telling us, taking decisions based on that. Um, so with the retention numbers, since you do not have uh, benchmarks, um, does it, I mean, how, how, how confident does it make you feel and how much control do you have on, on retention in improving the retention numbers? That's a great question. So our retention among our core users uh, at a four week level uh, uh, stands at around, around 50%, 50 to 52%. Um, and now four weeks is a long time. Uh, uh, so the first thing we're, we're trying to convince ourselves is how do we get people back uh, every day onto the app? But we also have to tell ourselves that for a video-based travel app, people may not come back every day. They will come back, however, when uh, there's a, you know, let, let's take an example, right? So my own vacation is next month. Uh, my next vacation is in July. Why? Because I have an anniversary coming up. And uh, we take an annual trip then. We also take trips at other times of the year, but the, the July one is for sure. Now, because of this life event, I know that the two months or the three months leading up to it, I will be a lot more active on Unravel uh, because I'm looking for ideas, be because I'm looking to uh, close out the itinerary. I'm also aware acutely that I will not go and book in my very first instance. It's going to be, you remember the 40%? Uh, those next levels will be, the percentage will go down, right? But 
it needs to happen for the whole booking to close out. Right. Will happen over three, four. So far, all the bookings we've seen have happened over three, four sort of visits to the app. So there are two factors essentially driving it. Factor number one is, are there certain life events or are there triggers which are making me come back? Right. The other factor is the app is so uh, you know exciting that I treat it as a little bit of entertainment and right. a little bit of travel inspiration. Right. It is the latter we want to achieve right. uh, because then it becomes more frequent, right? And today, a lot of Gen Zs are looking for entertainment-based shopping, not just in travel. I mean, there's this, um, I think, app named Duin, uh, Duini in China. I, I'm not pronouncing the name correctly, uh, which has live stream shopping. Um, and live stream shopping of various things, I mean, accessories, tech products. So what they do is uh, there's someone, there's an influencer live on video uh, trying to do, uh, you know, video shopping. It, it's the, the TVC of our days, if you remember, the Noctols of our days, right? Uh, there would be a channel, one guy shouting and magic duster and this, that. It's the same concept on TikTok. They are doing, uh, I think their revenues in 2022 are 450 billion in china alone so shoppable videos as a trend is is huge people want to be entertained while they're shopping it's it's retail it's digital retail therapy for them uh, so that entertainment quotient is big in travel as well so we are actually wanting people to come back every day uh watch those videos you don't have to book everything every day you can just save them for later you can just share them with your friends, plant ideas in your co-travelers, partners. That is increasing over time or within a certain segment where we're getting uh, their sort of personalization right. Uh, and of course, there are other tricks in the book there. You, know, you can send the right notifications at the right times, and the right sort of triggers or nudges at the right times. Um, and build a habit. Um, so, so for instance, one of the simplest things in the oldest tricks in the book is when do we typically explore such apps, right? We, uh, we do this before we go to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. We do this when we're taking a break from work during the day. It's very easy to note those times. Now, if you can provide a nudge, let's say there's a day when someone hasn't come in and we know that you've browsed Cappadocia the last couple of days. There's an interest building in Turkey. Just send them a quick nudge. This, uh, hey, check out this gorgeous video of hot, hot air balloon rise in Cappadocia. And uh, maybe that's a video they haven't seen before. If not anything else, just to see the video, they're going to come back. And that's that's all. That is the only nudge you need to give. Um, the rest will, will follow naturally. So uh, how do we benchmark ourselves? Right now, we're benchmarking ourselves against social media apps. We're not looking at travel apps. Um, and social media apps are retention-wise, day-wise retention-wise, still ahead of us but uh i think we are sort of slowly building ourselves up there got it so you so the the vision that you are building upon is or the banking upon is to create this as a social media platform where people yes. irrespective of whether they want to shop for a travel destination they want to spend time looking for inspirational and 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 travel videos which uh, for for today are there are there play, uh, players who are already f offering dedicated um, apps just for travel inspiration? Not with videos, no. Not with um, videos. no. Uh, nobody does with with the kind of videos we have. I think the other um, uh, we we all do it on Instagram and TikTok. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, subconsciously. Um, if you look at my Instagram feed, it's filled with travel because that's what I'm researching all the time. But I'm sure if you have certain interests, like our advisor, uh, Lewis Warner, who is uh, founder and CEO of Founders Factory, he's been a travel guy himself because he uh, is one of the earliest builders of lastminute.com. He is a huge surfing guy, right? And uh, he was telling me, hey, Abhi, my feed is, you know, constantly about surfing. And the way I interact with my surfing buddies is I find videos and new places. I, I discover surfing on TikTok, uh, places to see. And I share them with my friends who are in a WhatsApp group. 
Now imagine if all of that were to happen in the same platform, if uh, you know, Unravel recognizes Lewis as a surfing enthusiast, and it's constantly feeding them him and creating communities of uh, surfing enthusiasts. Mm. They're all sharing constant videos over there about where they've been, where the hottest news is. So Unravel becomes a platform of discovery for that very niche space alone. But then surfing is his sort of travel theme. For me, it is typically food or or cricket. Uh, for someone else, it is typically, um, you know, what children can do. So these little pockets of communities will start getting formed. Uh, today, travel specifically, nobody is doing that, and definitely not uh, two-way video-led uh, platform. Got it. Um, so, so you you mentioned about launch. What does what does launch look like in a B two C product? Like, what does like do you do you have a marketing splash? Do you get yourself um, uh, written in in travel blogs, PR? What does what does launch look like? And what what is a success? What, how was it for you in particular? That's a great question. We've debated this for hours together. <laughs> it was so our first idea of launch was a splash. You know, we'd launch the product. We'd go berserk on social media. We'll ask all our influencer partners to go talk about Unravel. And we would have uh, articles and newspapers and, uh, you know, digital blogs and things like that. Um, and I I think, oh, there's a question. There's uh, a question from Shekhar Tiwatne. Uh, unless it's already discussed, what are the plans, thoughts on web version of the app, or will it be mobile only for some time? So maybe you could also take some audience questions for, for more. Oh yeah, engagement. absolutely. And then yeah, we yeah, can, totally. then we can come back uh, to the launch. Uh, to yeah, the launch. Want to okay, answer? sure. Uh, Shaker, thank you for listening in, and thank you for the question. Uh, we are an app first, app only product right now. We intend to be app only. I think the progress will be iOS. Uh, Android and web app, um, and a large part of that is is uh, you know it's 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 a natural sequence we believe to find our true audience. If you think about it, if you custom if you think about users' uh, trust and users uh, the time they spend on apps versus web, um, we are an experience led platform, right? So uh, I, I don't think we want to be that website you find when you Google best deals for uh, so-and-so place and you find that although i'm sure we'll become that someday but we want you to come and engage build a travel community and uh, you know uh, really put your thoughts out there as a traveler so we will be app first uh, we are racing ahead to try and get android out after our ios and then of course we'll have to have a web app as well because that ultimately the inflow of users will come more naturally from there so uh, that will happen i think in about six months time that's my honest estimate cool i, I think you, you have some uh, uh friends loyal friends who are showing the support uh are, are they your friend <laughs> <They're, laughs> I've, I've mentioned deva a few times i think he's he's going to thank me later <laughs> and then there is uh, priya bansal uh, and then there is swarnim sharma thank you swarnim and then there is Gaurav Pandey. So thank you, Gaurav. Then there is Kara Vasista. Yeah, Vasista I've mentioned. Gaurav is is also our lead iOS developer, actually. Got so, it. Yeah. So they're Great. listening. Uh, let's let's come back to the launch then. Sure. Um, launch. So uh, you planned to go berserk. You wanted to go all in, and then what happened? What what changed? So. Uh, <laughs> I think we re we read uh, Andrew Chen's network effects, <laughs> so um, which I know cold, cold start covered. cold start cold problem start problem yeah um, so we we read the book and um, it it opened up a whole new world of ideas around what launch means for us um, and I I think the idea was um, we launched when was it late November early December of last year. Uh, it was the product was in its beta phase, um, and then uh, we didn't. 
it's not like we didn't make a splash. We announced it on social media. We encouraged, especially our followers, who we knew would sort of take to the app more naturally. Uh, we encouraged them to uh, come check out the app. Uh, and of course, friends and family and uh, known sort of validated beta testers of the app. Um, and so since then, I mean, as you'd expect, uh, the launch was, and, and of course, the influencers themselves, we asked them not to publicize it yet because we wanted the app to reach a stage where the utility value uh, initially came through booking. So we wanted to app, the app to reach a stage where at least some bookings were possible on the app before really making a splash. Uh, so late November, early December, I, I forget the date, but uh, was our public beta launch. Uh, we announced it on our social media channels. We announced it on and and very naturally saw an inflow of users coming in. We started to speak to a lot of users. Um, and I think going by Andrew's book, we, we, were, we were trying to find our product market fit with um, you know, what's that, what's our atomic network, uh, right? And what's our sort of, what's the network that uh, truly believes and uses the product regularly? Uh, to our surprise, and maybe not such a surprise because, um, you know, a lot of the content was Europe focused initially. The videos were Europe focused. Our partners were from Europe. So we wanted to target inbound traffic into Europe. We found a lot of uh, installs in India. Uh, coming from Instagram, but we surprisingly found a lot of installs coming from uh, UK and Europe. Uh, we only had TikTok running there. Later, a few days later, we learned that uh, Apple had featured us, and therefore a lot of users on App Store were finding, uh, you know, the app on App Store's homepage and downloading it to explore it. Uh, that. That little milestone sort of uh, did two things for us. One was it uh, it obviously brought a lot more attention and it sort of validated in our own minds that we had done something right. Um, but the other thing it, it did was I think it diluted the kind of audience we were targeting for our initial atomic network. And I'll explain why I'm saying diluting. Because if... And, and by now the data has proven it that users coming from TikTok and Instagram have been far more engaged than users coming in by looking at that app store feature. Because the intent of uh, the users coming in from Instagram and TikTok is that they expect something similar. They've been following us for a while. They expect something similar. And so this app is taking them a few steps ahead, a little more forward in that journey of figuring out their next vacation. Whereas the explorers from App Store had no expectations, really. They just came and they found an app. Oh, okay, there's videos to watch and okay, I'll see a few videos. And not a lot of them explored anymore. Um, so it diluted it somewhat because the data sort of was uh, a little spoiled by people with different intents. So whereas we wanted to really study whether what, what our originally intended users were doing. Um, so that was beta launch. And then uh, one of the feedback we heard, uh, especially in February, Jan, Feb, March was, uh, okay, you're sort of taking me all the way there and leaving me high and dry. So uh, when is bookings coming? So we, I, I think we took a very uh, um, accelerated approach towards redirecting people from videos to hotels. Activities we already had in app, that part of the work was done. Homes was also easier because Plum Guide has amazing content and they, even though we're redirecting, it doesn't feel that way. Uh, hotels we're redirecting to an affiliate partner. Um, we rushed into it simply because a lot of users were coming and telling us, uh, we love this, we're wishlisting this, but we really want to book it. Can you help us offline or online? Okay. So we sort of rushed into it and accelerated that process, launched it, uh, I think, early April, uh, late March. So I would say that is, in a sense, the launch of the product. But even there, we've not really done a splash. Uh, the splash will come when the network effects is possible. The network, network effects will be possible when two things will happen. One, 
if you find the app on Apple and if you share it with your close community of travelers or friends, they should all be able to see it and use it. Today, that's not happening because we don't have an Android version. You can only spread it among people on Apple. Uh, the second is uh, when you go through the whole user experience, we want people to be inside the app and we want to be able to be studying that behavior or that flow. Right now, once you're you redirected to our affiliate partner, we can't study your movements. Uh, and that leaves a gap in us understanding what is suiting you, what you're liking, what you're not liking. So the splash will come, uh, all the you know marketing blitz and blitz scale will come, especially from our influencer partners who've got 10, 15 million followers of their own. Uh, that will come once uh, the Android is there, that will come once the in-app hotel booking is there. Right. Um, sh- share with us your your memories of your first uh, organic transaction. Uh, somebody uh, actually made the purchase, and how was it? It uh, so the first known transaction was uh, was fun. The first known transaction was was a friend looking to make a booking, and all we had to do was uh, you know speak to them and uh, you know. Tell them, oh great, yes, we have this. So go try it out on the app. So it was it was a lot of uh, fun. Uh, I I think the most memorable one has to be early May, um, and this was uh, someone making a booking at the Four Seasons in Jimbaran. Uh, this is Four Seasons Jimbaran, Bali, uh, in Indonesia, uh, and they booked uh, I think four nights. Uh, four nights for uh, some amount of like three, four thousand dollars, and uh, and you know five percent of which has gone to our influencer partner. Um, I I think uh, Ravi, the the most satisfactory part of solving a problem is when you see others benefit from it, not you yourself. Yeah. yeah exactly. So so uh, I, I I think uh, that day was like a huge, huge sort of validation. That one transaction alone, because we knew that what we'd been telling our influencer partners over months had uh, you know come to fruit right. uh, in one single transaction. and and imagine there's there's potentially going to be many more. So uh, in terms of satisfaction in terms of uh, that that was by far the most. Someone found their dream holiday. And someone, you know, uh, earned a reward for having influenced them. We are just the mediators in between, so that was the most satisfactory. And the entire workflow is 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 now tested and trialed. It it works seamlessly. That means the, they are able to book, and the yeah. money, the commission is seamlessly going to the influencer. So the entire workflow is seamless now, or does it need any intervention from your end? There is one small intervention in, in all fairness, which is uh, the dashboard is there for us to see. The uh, the dashboard is there for them to see. Uh, the transaction itself is not automated. The transaction, once the transaction is automated and we don't have to play a role, then create. We, we, we're very, very cautious and very Indian or Desi in our mindset when it comes to money. So unless and until we are sort of 100% that everything's in order and giving the right amount, uh, we've, we've waited to automate automate that. But that was one of the reasons why we didn't launch the bookings early as well, Ravi. We were very hesitant to charge money to our consumers or even relay back money to our content creators if we weren't sure that everything worked 100%, we want to test that out in the market first. Uh, so we, we didn't feel comfortable charging money until March because by then we were confident a lot of people were using the app and there was, you know, uh, it was it was trusted. People were coming back. We felt confident about charging money for something. Um, so right now, yeah, the whole thing works. Uh, that one part where I have to pay the content creator for. Um, uh, I have to pay the content creator for what they've rightly earned. That part is still not open. Got it. How many transactions have happened by now? I lost count, but as of last week or last month, I think they were 25 to 30. 25. A little more, I think. And, and mostly uh, this is through, uh, through your social media followers and, uh, and word of mouth. Oh. 
this was largely social media followers. This was, uh, uh, I don't have the percentages, not, not a big number anyway. Um, a few friends, of course, uh, a few internal networks, of course, and that's how we know we'll build. Um, but uh, the interesting part here is uh, in terms of distribution, we started out by uh, having more activity bookings, frequency wise, numbers wise, more activity bookings, uh, and then home bookings, and then hotel bookings. And it was not surprising to us because the experience of booking each of these on the app is in that order as well. Activities is the most seamless. Home looks gorgeous, but it's a bigger ticket amount. Hotels is a redirect, so we kind of anticipated that will be less. Over a period of time, uh, that has, uh, over a period of time, meaning over the last four weeks or so, that has sort of flipped around. Uh, hotel bookings have been far more. People checking out hotels have been far more. It's a bigger ticket item. We don't see uh, how much time they spend after they're redirected, but we're able to see that 1,300 people have checked out vacation homes. Uh, and in the last three weeks alone, I think six, seven hundred have checked out hotels. Um, so uh, it's becoming it's it's a good validation of the fact that if you're graduating from booking an activity to uh, stay on the app, it tells us that the trust factor is going slightly up. Because when you're booking an activity on a new app, uh, Ravi, I mean, we might we might not care as much, but when we're booking a place to stay we'll think twice, right? We'll go back to our trusted sort of platforms. Uh, but the fact that more and more people are willing to take a step down the stay booking lane is, is a good sort of uh, validation. And yes, now we have a certain set of users trusting us with the stays. That's important. Got it. Um, all right. So you, you mentioned about advisory. Um, how how crucial is the advisory how how do you pick your advisory uh, again what is the relationship in terms of okay uh, do they do they also get equity uh, maybe maybe for for startup founders who uh, are clueless about picking advisory maybe maybe could you shed some light there as well oh it's a I, I wish I had a definitive answer Ravi but uh, I'll I'll share what we have in our case without revealing too many details. Um, the first advisor we had was uh, Rohan. Rohan is someone who's uh, who's a bit of a veteran in the travel industry. He Cornell graduate in hospitality, uh, then went on to work with Ratan Tata directly for Taj Group of Hotels. Um, uh, he was pretty instrumental in getting the Ambani weddings done as well. So he's he's been in hospi hospitality all his life and he was a close friend of Vijay's. So it was natural that we would vet the idea with him. Uh, he, he guided us in the early days and gave us ideas on which direction we should go into. Um, in his case, uh, because he was like a close uh, friend from before, he didn't, I'll admit we didn't sort of very clearly articulate what, what uh, his gains would be. Uh, now we have that in place. Um, but we have that in place more because uh, we brought uh, Lewis on board. And Lewis, we uh, sort of met almost coincidentally through our fundraising efforts. And we were uh, reaching out to Brent Hoberman. Uh, Brent is the uh, you know the founder of lastminute.com and he's uh, he's today he's he's the uh, the this thing of founders factory he runs multiple other startups himself and reached out to brent and written this note about what we're doing at unravel we'll try to reach out to people you know uh, like brent and uh, brent sent a very funny note to lewis copying me he said uh, uh, lewis remember this is what we were trying to do at lastminute.com um, so rings a bell, want to explore it. And uh, then Lewis reached out and uh, Lewis spoke to us and he was very, very welcoming, very, very, uh, he loved the idea. He wanted to, oops, you there? No, I'm, I'm, I'm there. I just lost my camera. Let me fix it. Oh. You, you continue talking. Should I continue? Yeah. So Lewis loved the idea. He, he heard out our vision. He tried to understand who we were, uh, where our strengths lay, why we were doing this, you know, what was the purpose? 
Um, and, uh, you know, then Lewis sort of laid out because of his, for the last seven odd years, Lewis has been in this ecosystem. You still there? I think I lost Ravi. I don't know if anybody else is listening in. Continue, continue. Uh, you there, Abhi? Yeah, sorry. No, go, go ahead, go ahead. I'm just, I was fixing my camera. So, so, go okay. Ahead. Uh, so, um, Lewis actually laid out a framework, and he's been doing this with startups for the last five, seven years. And the framework was very clear with what would be the expectation from Lewis. Uh, he identified two or three core areas. One was founders coaching. We all love that because we'd already interacted with him and we could, you know, the, the idea of coaching obviously is that at the end of it, you feel like doubly productive and doubly energetic, right? And you clearly know which path you want to get into. So we had that with Lewis. So that was a no brainer. Uh, we identified other areas he can influence us because of his uh, strong network within uh, startups as well as travel to help us with partnerships we may need in the future. So he laid out everything point wise very clearly. Then he laid out what would be sort of the uh, the interaction between him and us. Would it be on the basis of equity? Would it be on the basis of commission? Would it be something else? And there were two, three ways of doing it. Uh, number one is advisors typically take anywhere between one to two percent of equity if they're truly, truly embedded and truly, truly, uh, you know, involved with you. Because how, how, how do you? How do you ensure the involvement? And so, because this is again gray layer, layer right? It's laid out in contracts. Yeah, okay. It's laid out in, in the contract very clearly. Mm. Uh, and again, I mean, this was, uh, you know, how you and I may think it's a very, you know, gray area. Some, you, you sort of sense who's really involved and not involved. Right. Uh, but Lewis made it crystal clear in terms of what it should be. Right. And in my research with uh, similar advices, I found that you know equity is one part of it. They can also be a commission. <clears throat> they can be uh, they can be a monthly commission. In terms of how much time he would spend, you know, monthly there would be a management uh, board review. There would be two or three coaching uh, sessions for each of the founders uh, separately, uh, as well as him always being available. Uh, and he gave us a grace period. He told us. Uh, uh, I hope I'm not sort of revealing too much, but he told us, uh, you know, guys, if you don't believe I am of value to you, three, four months down the line, feel free to put a stop to it. And, you know, I, I'm not going to charge you anything. I am invested. I love the idea. I think there's great potential in what you're doing because you're trying to crack in, you're trying to marry inspiration with uh, travel planning and booking. Uh, a few people have tried to do that, but I believe the time is now because of the way people engage with videos, you, you guys are trying to take advantage of that. I think you have a great shot at it. So I'm going to help you three months down the line. If you feel I'm not doing enough, feel free to sort of put a stop to it. And it's not like we'll stop being friends, but uh, I will stop being a formal advisor to you. So I think laying out those points, Ravi made it easier to interact with him. Because we had all of that out of the day, out of the way. We didn't have at the back of our minds, uh, okay, he's helping us out. What do you think he expects? I mean, should we discuss it? Will it embarrass him if you offer him something? No, he made it crystal clear. And uh, after that was out of the way, it became considerably easier. So, yeah, I mean, highly recommend having strategic, influential people from the industry as coaches as as early as possible, I would say. But uh, also build that boundary of knowing whether something's someone's being beneficial to you. If they're not being beneficial to you, then you 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 don't owe them anything. It's your baby. It's your product at the end of the day. And incidentally, Lewis himself told us this. We we didn't sort of uh, uh, you know he himself said if you guys think this is useful, I mean, if you don't think it's useful, feel free to sort of put a stop to it. So we we love that. I think that's how it should be. So how many do you have as formal advisory? Two. Uh, so Rohan and Lewis are our two formal advisors. And uh, uh, yeah, Lewis is trying to speak to Brent next. So Got it. Excellent. Um, next is uh, fundraising. OK, uh, I know you are going through this um, um, angel fundraising and there are different stages. 
maybe you could um, uh, you could explain how does fundraising work in different stages i know you had a seed capital for 18 months uh, yep. so you, you must be burning that and then uh, you you also need to prepare for the next round of funds whether you go the angel route or whether you go go series um, uh, route uh, maybe sh- you could could you shed some light on first of all how did unravel happen not not not, not unravel uh, upscalers happen upscalers did, yeah how did you get to meet them how were you scouting like did you put the word out uh, maybe maybe on on the dynamics of uh, of getting funding no great great question and so many learnings ravi you you probably know this much better than i do i'll, I'll just share my experiences sure yeah, yeah. Uh, um so uh, yeah it's it's an interesting thing we we live in times where uh, uh, you know money in the market there's there's no shortage of money in the market i mean there's no shortage of uh, capital uh, but i think we're also at a stage where it's becoming more and more uh, well defined which is a good thing uh, when i say well defined i mean i'm i'm referring to vc money for starters i mean i, I think well defined in the sense that 10 years back vcs probably didn't have as many rules to follow uh, they a lot of them may have gone with their gut uh, a lot of them bet against the tide uh, today vcs have a lot more capital at their disposal and therefore a lot more rules they have to play by because they have uh, an obligation to their lps um so my first learning interacting with a lot of vcs over we we've, we've started both uh, ravi i mean we we know that vc raising takes time and it's a relationship built over time um so so we've started both we don't expect any vc mini we didn't even i mean we we knew it it will take 25 30 conversations with a single vc to actually uh, convert um so vc's process is more well defined it's it's more rules based and i think at the end of the day it's not you know they are putting someone else's money right so they have to have a mechanism that validates the whole process in their minds to convince themselves that they've taken the right decision angels on the other hand i think think from their hearts uh so i i think angels think they're a lot more open with their questions because they are putting their own hard earned money into it uh they're backing a vision they're not backing numbers they're backing uh what they're looking at you they're trying to assess is this a good guy uh is this someone i put, want to put my money on and is his vision something that will you know grow 100x in the next 3 4 years it'll be a billion dollar idea in the next few years and angels can ask all sorts of questions which are not well defined they don't have a you know book a, a rules book that they play by uh, which is so much fun because uh, some angels will bet on something that is completely against the industry tide uh, and they'll bet simply because the idea resonates with them they're interested in a certain field or 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 something strikes them as you know, as an opportunity it's a bet they're taking at the end of the day um so my 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 honest advice is is obviously you know like everyone says find people who believe in your vision first and foremost that they, even before you go speak to vcs even before you go speak to anyone outside uh you know equip yourself surround yourself with people who believe in your vision because if uh if they start to you know uh, because they'll be doing the job of selling this further uh right in your next rounds in your future rounds and and if they don't believe you in your vision today if they're only going by let's say a boom let, let's say you know we as an example uh, in february uh on two particular days ravi we had over 3 400 downloads uh why because apple was featuring us now if i went and told a vc on that day, not vc let's say an angel investor on that day you know what our product is booming we've got these many downloads we we would probably have got quite a few people interested but if they were going to invest in unravel because there were two days of insane downloads and apple featured us 
I don't think it would be in the, the right partnership for us. I think the right partnership is having people like you, Yuan, who understand the vision and are betting on the vision and are betting on us to execute on that vision. So uh, surrounding yourself with that initial set of people, I think, is is extremely key for your own sort of sanity. Uh, and uh, how we met upscalers, second part of your question, is uh, we were doing this reach out to a few, um, again, specific strategic investors in the space. Uh, and Yuan was one of them. Uh, so when it went to Yuan, uh, or I think it went to Tim, I, I forgot. Uh, he came and checked out the app like a crazy user. And we didn't know who it was. And we didn't even know Tim was interested in the investment. We could see someone from France was like... Would you repeat that again? So how was it? Uh, so you you said you met some strategic investors and that's how you got connected. So was it in the... We London? reached out. No, no, we reached out uh, to... We had an original uh, list of uh, uh, people that we wanted to reach out to. We reached out to uh, Yuan, Tim, uh, Brent was a part of that list. We cre- created a list of people that who were active investors, seed and pre-seed uh, in B2C ideas, especially in the video or travel space. Uh, and they were part of that list. Um, so there was this simple, brief email uh, uh, as uh, you know, a lot of people recommend when you write cold emails, keep it very brief, very precise, one line action item that we'd written. Um, and uh, I think uh, it was Tim who reached out on LinkedIn uh, and said, guys, uh, you have an excellent idea. I want to chat immediately. And uh, we could see that someone from France, we didn't know it was Tim. We could see that someone from France was continuously coming to the app and checking out the app uh, mm-hmm. and engaging with it. We made the connect later on that it was Tim. Uh, so we had a chat with Tim and we liked him instantly. He was, so, so Tim, you know, Tim is truly Gen Z, right? He's, young guy, likes traveling all the time on social media. Uh, so we knew whether or not Tim and you all invested, we knew Tim as a user would be like very engaged. So Tim was like, uh, yeah, I mean, I, he asked a bunch of questions about what our vision was, et cetera. Second conversation, he brought Yuan into the conversation. And Yuan asked us more pointed questions about what our ideas were, how we were doing, and what was the vision, where we were taking it next. And uh, at the end of the call, you know, Tim was like, yeah, I told Yuan, we don't really need a conversation. We're in, we, we want to be involved with you guys. We love your idea. We love your product. And Yuan was like, you know, a big yes from our side. We are in. We're like... We're going to be your partners no matter what and spread the message. Now, um, forget about the, the, the money and the amount of funds you're raising. The whole validation from the two of them, because they had seen the product, uh, and we had spoken to quite a few angels before that also, uh, and we couldn't really connect if they were truly checking out the product and understanding the vision. Like They were looking at the deck. They were looking at numbers. They were looking at the team, which is all the right things to do. But Tim and Yuan were one of the first few to really check out the product. And in future calls, Tim and Yuan were giving us ideas, a lot of which we had already thought to, some of which we had not thought to. So that's how this was built. This is, I think, early May or mid-May. Uh, Got it. And that's how we met you. And that's how we met everyone at Upscalers. Got it. So there is this angel, um, which would take care of, like, how do you differentiate between angel and your series A? Uh, like, is this to buy time till the time the, the, the conversation matures with a, with, with a yeah, VC? Or how does it, what's the decision like? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, series A will happen when we've got numbers. So even if someone uh, looks at our idea and then looks at our traction, it becomes a no-brainer uh, for them to invest. That's when we know we are series A. Um, and that will that'll have to be a VC. Uh, right now, we're trying to bring on board people or angels who have uh, who are betting on our vision and our execution. Uh, the numbers are, I mean, being a statistician, Ravi, I mean, even with the number of users we have, let's see, that's going to hit 10,000 by the, by the end of this month. In iOS, we launch Android, which will again take off with many more users because there are more Android users than iOS. Right. But um, we know in our heart of hearts as statisticians that uh, uh, to draw any um, substantial conclusions about a 
million users from a base of a few thousand users is not really you know fair i mean yes you can make your all your projections and your assumptions and all of that but uh, today if you're if you're betting on unravel and and whoever's come on board i know for a fact that they're taking the decision based on the vision and the product um, and, and the people so the vc will come uh, when you know i think with the runway of the next four months or so Got it. Um, when we have that kind of traction a little bit of revenue. So just, sorry, just to add one single point, uh, a, a few VCs, there've been two types of VC conversations also I've had. One is uh, a VC who's told us very clearly that uh, this is a VC in the US, that he's interested in us as long as we are becoming a successful social travel app. So he's interested in engagement numbers, retention numbers. He doesn't care about, he says bookings. I don't care about for the next two years. It's, it's a false indicator. Uh, but there've been the other kind of VCs who are saying that hey, at the end of the day, I want to see you make bookings. So the moment you have a runway of, uh, 25, 30,000 a month, uh, in revenue, uh, I'm in, and you know, I'm happy to sort of lead the conversation. So. So they, there's both sides to it. And uh, I think we, as a company, have to take a choice on which one we want to satisfy. Got it. Uh, and how do you decide uh, upon, uh, I mean, you, you can choose not to answer this, but valuation conversations. Oof. Uh, yes. So are there are guidelines? Like, I, I know there are. There are negotiations. I can, <laughs> I, I, I can recommend the videos I've watched of Ashwat Damodaran uh, to understand valuations, but that's that's more a theoretical exercise, I think, uh, than anything. Um, no valuation conversations are, of course, you have your uh, you know uh, cash flow uh, calculations to determine that. But like I was saying, there's really not enough data for anyone to do and defend a fair assessment of the valuation today. Um, and I don't think it'll be for any startup uh, that is pre-Series A. Um, even Series A, I would say for B2Bs, it's a lot easier because they have clear numbers, a certain set of clients, revenue traction. For a B2C, it's that much harder. So what do you do in a B2C? You look at competitors uh, and what they were in their early stages or your competitors who are at your early stages. And you try to fit it in, into that range in terms of whether you're doing slightly better or slightly worse than them. So that is how we've done it. We've looked at uh, our immediate competition. And there are a few. Uh, again, nobody who's betting as big on video, but uh, there are similar players in both US and Europe. Uh, and uh, you know, Crunchbase will tell you what the amount they've raised is. And a simple basis of assumption of how much they would have diluted will tell you what their valuation is. So that told us where the range should be. Uh, that combined with the fact that I believe at least that we are much ahead of them because we've got all our legitimate legal licenses in place. Okay. Uh, we've got the end-to-end -end bookings in place after it's tried and tested. Absolutely no trouble with uh, the regulation behind it. Uh, we've got the leanest possible, the most optimal possible team in place, mm -hmm. and our burn rate, thanks, of course, to, uh, though I say so publicly, but thanks, of course, to the right combination of people from India and other parts of the globe, is less than half of the others. And that I validated this time from my trip to the US. So with a lean burn rate and lean team, with all the partnerships in place, the product that we believe looks far better than most of our competition, if they've raised money at X, we believe we'll be selecting more. So that's how we've done our valuation. Got it. So so we we have hit two two hours already, and I know you are wow. doing you you are doing most of the talking. So I'm I'm sensitive to that as well. Uh, it, it can sap your energy out. Uh, just last question that I want to ask you is I, I I forgot to ask is you you mentioned when Apple picked your app uh, featured your app. How did how did that happen? And how does that happen? Is is it like uh, do, do you do you sign up for such a such a uh, program or does it happen organically and then somebody l lets you know from there? How, could you could you explain how this Apple feature works? Um, yeah, uh, it was a surprise, Ravi, when we found it. Like I said, there was this one day in February 
when uh, we suddenly saw downloads become like uh, 10 times of what they usually were and we went scratching around to find why this was happening and uh, we were worried something wrong is actually happening we found uh, an article on this website called tap smart um, and uh, we found that they had featured us in their top 3 apps to watch out for in 2022 and we said wow someone come you know unknown has featured us and they they hit the nail in terms of calling out the app as being this you know uh, amazing uh, discovery and uh, it takes the planning completely out of travel i said okay maybe you know blogs are it's a marketing lesson for us blogs really work um and then something wasn't right because it is possible of course to track where your downloads are coming from and uh, if it were coming from an external website then it would have said that uh, you know the source is a web referrer but it kept telling us that the source is uh, app store browsing so then uh, vijay was scrolling through his app store and he found that the app was featured on the home page itself and uh, it was only in uk and ireland which is why we couldn't see it um, so it happened the first i mean the first uh, few times it happened it happened purely by accident uh, then we started to read up how apple features you and we learned that uh, apple typically takes in invitations so you have to write to them and uh, then they consider you and which we decide we did not which you did not which we did not which we did ah. not so apple typically takes in there's a form you have to fill and you know apple expects certain qualities and trade uh, qualities and benchmarks in terms of design in terms of execution uh, if they like it 6 weeks after your application they might reach you so uh and this is in the developers forum uh, and and we and then we found red blogs about how to get your app featured on app store etc and we realized there's a lot of effort that goes into it uh what worked i think in our favor was that the design was very doodle led and it was very uh, it, it was very illustrative and uh, i i think we realized that combined with our content the the, the design or the brand of the app sort of played a key role in being selected but it happened purely naturally but if someone wants to do it uh, there is a way there is a formal way of doing it uh, if you're lucky you get dis- discovered and you know i suspect we got discovered when we released the beta app in december um, and but if you want to actively pursue it there is a way you you can sort of put in your arguments apple is very supportive if you obviously you know feature more of apple stuff which is if you promote apple pay um if you uh, if you promote app store in an, any other way apple keeps launching features from time to time on app store new features if you're making use of those uh, sorry developer features not on app store apple keeps launching developer features if you're using those developer features and doing something unique they love that uh, but admittedly we i mean i i don't know that we it was probably a combination of things we did uh, which is why it got featured so they have a list of guidelines on where you need they to do. check the boxes otherwise they do so one of your strength is is the design, because this is a consumer product you cannot compromise on the design and and gen z as well right so they, you need to cater to cater to their sensibilities and their tastes um and great excellent well this uh, I, i i i still had a lot of questions but you know what i'm i'm being sensitive to abhinav abhinav's time and uh, but yeah i mean it's it's not the last time we are talking we could we could again uh, get into we should, totally <laughs> totally so, you know thanks you 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 took me through a lot of areas that i actually had forgotten and so thanks for covering everything because you were bringing up questions around uh, the launch you were bringing up questions around the fundraising about the partnerships and why i these were i i had almost forgotten about these so you brought a lot of a lot of nostalgia back to life so happy happy I'm to not, share happy to do this again i'm 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 plain curious and yes the stories change at different stages of of a yeah. startup right so yeah once you have a, a vc round once you have scale um a lot more it will have a different kind of conversation and uh, yeah and and things will get busier for you so i would have to look for your uh, empty calendars to have you uh, on on this on this chat no. again but Actually, uh, no, that won't be the case for me <laughs> had a lot of fun 
Excellent. Well, this brings us to the end of a fascinating conversation with Abhimanyu. Learned a lot. Uh, I haven't had such deep conversations with a B2C player per se. Not as deeply as this. I, I, I have had one three-hour conversation. Yes, that was B2C as well. But uh, this was a completely different uh, kind of a conversation. Not not just product, but all aspects of the uh, the business overall and how how an idea germinates and how it catches it's it's like a virus that catches first your first few early um um yeah backers right so you you were the early backers and then how how this transforms and I'm, i'll be very very keen to see how this journey eventually translates into something bigger i will do uh, since i'm i'm all, also invested into this also very passionate about this 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 field um yeah i'll do do my best to spread the word out and i think our listeners are also who are keen and listening to this should do the same abhimanyu if if people want to reach out to you in some way what is the best way to to get to you oh um happy to share my email id uh for one but uh for today's generation i think the easiest way is to dm us on uh, instagram or or tiktok Uh, we are at unravel dot app. Uh, unravel dot app is where Insta is it? On Insta, yeah. Unravel dot app. I'll share the links with you. Yeah, you could share it here so that I could uh, I'll just yeah. Or maybe let me just quickly share the screen here. Unravel dot app. This is the one, right? Uh, so you have you have forty two thousand followers. That's that's look, looks. So does does many of this content um, also be available? The same content on the app and on Insta. Is that how it is? Or that that is the idea. So the idea is that uh, whatever you're seeing here will be on the app, and there'll be an extension in the sense that it'll allow you to uh, plan, book, save, wishlist, share everything. So. Uh, we are delib- so so think of tiktok and instagram as as sort of the first 10 20% of what you'll experience on the app on unravel correct excellent and and if somebody dms on unravel app you would be able to they would be able to get to you right sure dm us on uh, instagram dm us on uh, you can post comments on tiktok you can reach out to us on linkedin and my own uh, uh, email id as well always always looking for people to reach out and and share feedback that's the only way we can really uh you know learn more about how people are using it so you you've done quite a bit of those there's actually a good place to learn. i just opened Sorry. tiktok and then- yeah so tiktok also you yeah tiktok being tiktok so you have a bigger follow followership on tiktok like 151k yeah yeah, yeah so so our our uh, recommendation algorithm is actually built on tiktok's principles as well because tiktok's yes. tiktok allows you to get to a much wider reach much faster got so it. you yes. see we've got uh, yeah 150000 odd i think followers on tiktok um, but yeah so yeah sorry i was saying before i forget ravi um, we are offering uh, free vouchers of uh, $25 for just speaking to us, giving us feedback on the app, uh, oh, and an additional additional fifty dollars uh, if you make a booking of a hundred or more, if you are just providing us with that feedback, we're just looking for ten minutes of your time to capture your feedback after you've used the app, of course, and uh, we're looking to learn. So sign up. There's absolutely nothing to lose except those ten minutes of sharing your so, honest feedback. Do you? Okay, that, that that's great news for 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 listeners. Uh, do you also have geographical uh, constraints? Like, where where are you launched? Like, which uh, that is a question from Pragati, who says, "Are you are you people planning to launch it region wise or planning to launch it across the globe?" The app is global, so you can download it anywhere at all. Um, I think the latest set of users are from Saudi, um, so the app is global. You can download it anywhere you want. The destinations we target are determined based on where we uh, partner up with content creators from. And our first sort of starting launch phase destination is inbound traffic to Europe. 
Uh, so Pragati, um, I don't know where in the world you are, but you can download the app. Uh, yeah, so it's launched across the globe on uh, iOS. You can download it if you have an Apple iPhone. If you have an Android iPhone, uh, give us a month, you'll have it on Android as well. Um, in terms of region, our focus more is on uh, inbound traffic to Europe. Uh, and a few tropical areas. There's uh, Bali, there's Maldives, there's uh, uh, French Polynesia, there's parts of Middle East, a little bit of Mexico, but mostly inbound Europe right now. And we want to focus on that simply because we, we saw Europe as an opportunity for the largest domestic uh, destination uh, with rich and diverse. Destination. But of course, needless to say, it will slowly expand later this year to all of Europe, parts of the US and Asia and next mid same time next year I would imagine having uh, over 10,000 destinations covered across the globe so but the app is available for download everywhere excellent Abhimanyu thank you so much again and see you around